Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Samsung Fino 800 which is a, an automatic zoom compact camera. It was also known in some markets as the Maxima Zoom 80Ti. Uh, it is in fact quite a modest specification of camera but a little bit interesting nonetheless. When I was using this I did run a roll of film through it. I did find some of the things a little frustrating about it. Uh, firstly, the problems that you have with zoom compact cameras being the maximum aperture is very modest and this takes that to another level, which we'll talk about a little later. And then some of the specification choices that Samsung put on the camera did seem a bit odd. But anyway, let's start by putting some batteries in as always. Uh, the battery cover is just on the base plate here. Ooh. Slides open, there we go. Got a plus terminal, a negative terminal, and it runs on standard, as people call them, AA alkaline batteries. I know a lot of people are very happy when cameras run on alkaline cells or AA cells rather than lithium cells, but uh, there we go. That's the batteries installed. Uh, and now let's uh, turn it on and see what we've got. So all the, all the action really happens on the top plate here. The power button will activate it, the lens will pop out, lens cover opens. Speaking of the lens, it's a 38 to 80 millimeter range. Uh, so 80 divided by 38 is just a pinch over two. So this is just slightly bigger than a two time zoom, which isn't a huge zoom range to be perfectly honest with you. It's a Samsung SHD lens. So I would imagine Samsung are hoping people will regard that as super high definition. Weirdly, although I found this frustrating to use, I would say all the photographs on the roll of film came out. Some came out better than others, but they all came out. And that's uh, a good thing, obviously. Looking at the specifications, I mentioned the maximum aperture of this. Now with a zoom lens, as you go from one end to the other, uh, you do lose a little light on the way to the film plane. Now I was hoping that this might be an f4.5 at the wide end to maybe an f10 at the 80mm end. I thought it might be a 5.6 to 11, but actually the maximum aperture of this lens is f6.3 at the wide end and f12.3 at the 80 millimeter end. So f12.3 isn't a terribly useful aperture. Now 80 millimeters is a great focal length for portrait photography as I'm sure you're aware. But um, f12.3 is not a great aperture for portrait photographs. So what I found frequently was it wanted to fire the flash uh, in operation. Now I loaded up a 200 ASA film. The ASA range is, is remarkably wide. It's uh, 50 to 1600. So if you can get a 4 or 800 ISO film that might well be worthwhile. Although this is a zoom lens it has four elements. Two of which are spherical, that's to say it's having a continuous curve, they sort of dimple up a little bit. But as we'll see in the photographs later on, it, it, when, the, when the subject's absolutely basking in direct sunlight, surprisingly sharp results. So, let's have a look. <coughs> Zoom control is the two buttons here. The buttons on the top plate with this LCD tell you what's going on. So at the moment, every time you turn it on, every time you turn it on, it goes to auto, flash with red eye reduction. So if you were to turn that off and we can that's auto flash without red eye reduction. That is force flash on or fill flash, very useful mode. And flash off. So if you wanted to turn the flash unit off um, as you're wandering around, every time you turn the camera off and turn it back on again, it defaults to automatic. On the other button you can see we've got a self timer, a two second self timer, and weirdly for a zoom compact, a bulb mode. 
So if we go through the modes here, little arrow points to the self timer, then to the bulb mode, and then to the two second self timer. Can you see the problem with that? I can turn the flash unit off, that's fine. What I can't do is select either of the self timers and the bulb mode. Oops, wrong button. And there's no remote control with this, there's no little infrared clicky button type thing. So if I want to use the bulb time, <laughs> I have to press the button to start the exposure. There's no delay. Now in bulb, I'm just going to turn that flash off. The minimum exposure time when you press the button is one second. And that could potentially be quite useful at times. And it goes up to a maximum of 60 seconds. You can see the seconds counting in the display there. But because I'm having to physically press the button, I'm also physically jiggling the camera, which in reality makes the bulb mode unusable. Anyway, let's load a film and see how we get on. Yeah. Film loading is very, very simple, and that is always a good thing. Every video it feels like I talk about film loading as being the most important thing, and it really is. As I always say, if you don't get the film in the camera correctly, you're not getting any pictures at all. So the film cassette goes in this side. The film leader feeds over to the other side there. And we close the back. This is showing an error message, so I've got that wrong. That's super useful to know. I'm not quite sure what the error is, however. There we go, it doesn't, wasn't quite seated correctly. So now it's showing number one because that's your first frame ready to take. I've just brightened up the exposure a little bit. I thought that was a little bit dark. So, there we have it. Autofocus, auto exposure. Shutter speed range from a very modest 250th of a second to a third of a second. With that 6.3 to 12.3 aperture, though 250th, is more than fast enough for most things really not much else to add so long as you use a fast iso film and your subject is basking in sunlight this will produce a decent result <laughs> the bold mode i don't know why it's there honestly i've got two theories about that one is the the chip on the circuit board was used in another camera that had a remote control of some kind and it was just cheaper to leave the mode on. The other is the Samsung designers deliberately wrote software for this camera that allowed for bulb exposure with no way of tripping the shutter remotely. There's not really a lot, great deal to add. When you get to the end of the film it will rewind automatically. I should point out this little button here. If you get a constant green light like that then the autofocus is ready there's nothing to worry about. I'm just going to cover the exposure cell if I can. If you get a blinky green light, okay, let's fire a frame. There we go. If it blinks, then it's uh, charging the flash unit. So it's going to fire the flash whether you want to or not. And then you've got the choice of going through the various flash modes. If you use the self timer, I'm just going to turn the flash off. Turn the self timer on. You get a blinky red light on the front of the camera that starts off quite uh, sedately and gets quicker. And bang, it takes the picture. Speaking of pictures, let's take a look at a few. So when I um, went for a little, I suppose you call it a photo walk with this camera. Uh, I stopped off at this parish church. As you can see, the sun's quite low in the sky. This was mid-January, but you can see from the very hard shadows that it was still a very sunny day. At the wide end, perfectly nice photograph. Very happy with that. What's not to like? 
if I told you that was shot on something like an Olympus Mu 2, there'd be no reason to doubt what I said. If we were to zoom in a little bit, however, so if you go to the 80mm end, that 6.3 aperture has now dropped off to 12 point. We're going to get camera shake. So it'll either fire the flash unit, so you won't get camera shake, but of course the flash isn't strong enough to illuminate an entire church. It barely reaches a couple of metres. So you're going to end up with a blurry picture if you turn the flash off. But nonetheless, it, it came out, it's a picture, it's fine. Uh, also worth noting on those pictures, the relatively modest difference between the wide end and the long end. So let's move along see what else we have. Now as I've been saying throughout this video, if your subject's in direct bright sunlight, no problems at all. And because the sun's off to one side and at a fairly low angle, there's a lot of texture shadows in that stonework. I don't think anybody would be unhappy with that. I think uh, I've got a couple of images that uh, sort of show that type of sharpness detail. There's not much evidence of vignetting in these images when it's a bright sunny day. We'll see in a few moments that vignetting does creep in at the marginal exposures. So here we can see it's getting a little bit a little bit dark and creepy in the corners. Um, now because of the tendency of the camera to go for uh, slower shutter speeds, as I say the slowest automatic shutter speed is a third of a second I did try a couple of intentional camera movements try to make virtue out of necessity so that's the best of the ICM shots I took uh, which actually I quite like uh, it probably doesn't look so good on YouTube with the compression but um, the grain of the film and the vertical wavy stripes does give it uh, I suppose one would say a painterly quality I quite like the the way the arch in the doorway is reflected in the arch in the foliage and the path leads not just to the doorway but actually merges with the doorway. I actually quite like that picture. Now, speaking of intentional camera movements, that was the best one. Others were less pleasing. So let's just uh, zip through some other uh, pictures here. Looking at the wide shot of the church, that's perfectly nice. But when I zoomed into 80mm, uh, to photograph just the top of the spire uh, of course it immediately wanted to fire the flash and the flash isn't going to reach that far so in reality although this is a zoom compact there aren't that many occasions when you're going to be able to use the 80mm end you should really probably consider this as a, a 38mm automatic compact camera and even then at 38mm it's still f6.3 max. So what else do we have? Well, we have an old favourite here. A little picture of a dovecot. It's fine. You know, anybody would be perfectly happy with that. Again, looking at this signpost, the uh, text on the signpost, really sharp. Good exposure. Little vignetting again, but the lighting is quite marginal. Now, when you get into deeper shadows, it does want to fire the flash unit. And this is actually a photograph taken with basically fill flash. This sort of park, uh, lake area, was the route of uh, a, a railway line. Um, it says Bedford to Cambridge, because this is quite near to Bedford, the town of. Uh, in reality, it went from Cambridge all the way to Oxford, but uh, it was one of those routes that was closed down in the 60s and is now a little bit of a nature reserve I think there's some fishing lakes there and that sort of thing bit of an odd triptych I suppose you call it this is actually I mentioned the railway a second ago this was the railway station that's uh, where it's got that graffiti that's the end of the platform as was and you can see that uh, or maybe you can't the trains would have gone down both sides of that so a double sided platform I suspect not going to get into the history of British railways because I'm not an expert on it a little bit closer to again looking at the sharpness like a lot of these lower price zoom compacts you do get some vignetting but the sharpness of the lens certainly at the wide end can't really be faulted 
absolutely nothing wrong with those pictures whatsoever. Good colour rendition as well. I know I sort of um, turned my nose up at this SHD marking on the lens, but it is a multi-coated lens, it is a four element lens. It's not the most sophisticated optic, but it's better than some, and we'll look at that again in a moment. Now continuing my series, or occasional series of park bench photos, this was with fill flash, and the bench was a couple of meters away. It was really just at the very edge of the flash reach. Uh, it's a modest kind of a flash unit with a modest kind of an aperture, but really a very nice fill flash. It's it's filled in the foreground detail, which was in shadow, and the background detail where the sunlight's coming through the trees. It's balanced it out very nicely. In photograph, but um, there you have it. Uh, again, looking at the zoom range. This is our 38mm end, perfectly nice, and that's our 80mm end. So there is a difference, certainly, but it's not radical. And lastly, we've got a picture shooting very much into the light. Wanted to see what the lens flare would be like, and surprisingly, to me at any rate, not bad at all. This is the sun, slap bang in the middle of the frame, and the lens flare is remarkably well controlled. Uh, you can see on the right hand side here there's a black bar and a little slither of another frame of film. This was actually the 37th frame on the roll of film. So I got 36 and 9 tenths of a picture. So those are the photographs. As I say, some are, some are better than others. There were quite a few blurry ones. Um, but they still nonetheless came out and you could see what was going on. So, as ever, what are one of these what should one of these cameras cost you and should you buy one well when it was new and this camera was launched in 2002 at the uh, photo marketing association show in las vegas it had an rrp of 49 pounds and 99 pence so in 2002 camera phones were sort of becoming a thing and digital cameras were in their infancy, but at the start of 2002, you could easily get a three megapixel camera, which would produce an acceptable six by four inch picture. Uh, and by the end of 2002, that had gone up to five megapixels. And of course, people could see how the cameras, the digital cameras were developing. They understood the price would come down and the specification would go up. So people weren't that eager to buy new film cameras particularly compact film cameras. Uh, the manufacturers, I suppose you could say, had to show a little ankle. They had to make a, a zoom compact that looked good, that had uh, apparently a decent specification and at a very, very low price point, £50. Uh, I don't know how they made it, to be perfectly honest, at that price. Now today, because this does date from 2002, it's only just got the key to the front door. Um, which is a saying in the UK, meaning it's 21 years old. That's not terribly old for a Zoom Compact, and that's a good thing, because all Zoom Compacts have a flexible circuit board called a Zoom Shutter Flex, uh, and over time they concertina and they crack, and you can have a camera that appears to work perfectly well, but then the autofocus doesn't work or the exposure's wrong. So if you look at a, a Pentax Zoom 70, the original Zoom Compact camera from the late 80s, I'm not quite sure exactly when that came out, that's got a, another decade or two on, in terms of age on this. So the other thing with these cameras from the turn of the century, they didn't have a lot of films put through them. People bought them, used them for a couple of years, and then typically bought a digital camera shortly thereafter. So they're kind of low mileage, relatively young compared to many zoom compacts now of course here at mostly vintage cameras we love a turn of the 20th century camera a folding bellows camera or uh, some other obscure film format or whatever uh, and they have a, a charm and a use of their own when it comes to zoom compacts they are a consumer electronic product they do have bits that wear out on them and that break and crack so a younger one is not a bad bet. I really didn't want to recommend this camera, and I'm, and I'm sort of not recommending it. 
that maximum aperture is just too slow. Um, but if you were going to the Costa Blanca and you put a 4 or 800 ISO film in it and you only wanted you know, casual snapshots if you're going on what you might call a messy holiday then why not? One thing I would say and where this camera definitely is worth considering is if you're ever tempted to buy a single use or disposable camera those are now quite expensive uh, I've seen them at 17 99 and I was actually in a camera shop the other day and watched somebody hand over £24.95 for a single single use camera uh, and that's horribly horribly expensive this camera you can find them on eBay I wouldn't pay more than £10 for one there are people selling them for 30 40 and even £50 and I think that's just too much money for them um, but if you can find one for £10 or thereabouts as an alternative to a single use camera you're getting a better quality lens you're getting a faster aperture lens at least at the wide end um, single use cameras tend to be f10 and at 38mm this is 6.3 it's a multi-coated lens, better control of lens flare so as an alternative to a single use camera yes Samsung Fino 800 and other cameras of this type and there are quite a few at this time uh, well worth considering um, but if you want an automatic compact camera maybe there are better options on the market uh, but make sure they work anyway this video has uh, gone on far too long I hope you found it of some use or interest thank you for watching I do appreciate it